Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Michael Malhlava and I'm from His Data. Thank you for invitation from uh, Sri. And I would like to speak about how to make a better prediction and with help of Scala. So the first, the first part of the talk will be about our Scala API, which is still in the progress, and we are trying to make it better, better, and better. And then Cliff will explain some uh, technical details, how to, how to tune JVM to its limits. So why are we focused on better predictions? You know, there are a lot of, there is big hype uh, about big data. A lot of people are interested in that, a lot of companies collecting a uh, lot of data. So we are trying to participate in this world and make them better. And make them better, make them better by framework which is called H2O. H2O, yeah. It's open source framework which in fact provi uh, provides in memory computation and prediction engine. And I was asked to play a short video which will introduce, which will introduce, uh, where is it? <laughs> which will introduce H2. Ah, here is it. So I will refresh the page. And it's just one minute video explaining all the aspects of H2O. So your business has massive amounts of customer data stored in Hadoop that you need to analyze. The more data you analyze, the better you can predict how to serve your customers. But organizing and analyzing this data requires complicated math, and modeling this data to come up with better predictions usually takes days to weeks and is often error prone. So what's the best solution? Quite frankly, it's H2O from OX Data the industry's first open source prediction and math engine that will enable you to make better predictions and build accurate models faster. And as makers of the parallelized modeling and scoring engine of Hadoop, we got you covered. Here's a real world example. Let's say your business is trying to understand the best product placement for optimal customer engagement. So you wanna model the interactions of your customers on your website to make better predictions on what they wanna do next. Well. H2O allows you to model all of your data with better algorithms using many machines. This way you won't have to sample a smaller data set for performance reasons. H2O then allows you to score hundreds of models in nanoseconds and deliver better predictions to your business. The reality is data is messy and so many hours of data science go into moving big files and munging missing features. And that's why we design H2O's data console to make those tasks a piece of cake within a familiar interface. Simply put, H2O makes big data science, well, simple. So when you're ready to mine the true gold hidden within your big data, you're ready for H2O. Okay, so, so that was a short marketing video about H2O. I like the video because it's really you know, cool with a lot of presentation, a lot of animation and so on. Okay, can you see that? Okay. So I will go back to the slides and make some uh, technical details about H2O. It's in fact Java platform. So we are running on JVM and we are doing in-memory computation. We are not like Hadoop. We are not storing any temporary data to HDFS or some, uh, some distributed storage, but we are loading data to the memory and then make quick, fast computation uh, over the data with a lot of performance tuning. This, in fact, supports different styles of programming, but you know, a lot of people for this kind of computation are using Mabridu style, so it's uh, also our paradigm which we use, but internally we use Fortune framework from Doug Lee. And uh, the whole platform is accessible via, uh, via, via different clients. One client it's used for testing is the Python client, which access H2O REST API for doing the operation. And then we have also R clients. R client, which uh, use the same way how to access uh, all functionality of H2O but 
you know, there are some limitation of REST API which we cannot uh, cross. So we also provide Java API, which is a little bit lower level API, how to, how to compute over the data. And that was the reason why we also want to introduce the Scala, some Scala access to this API. Because if you look at the example of our internal API, it was designed or it is designed to be performant and really allows you to access whole data distributed in, across the cloud in low level way. So a lot of users are confused by this API. You can see there are a lot of uh, weird words like chunk or uh, set zero, at zero, and so on. So we would like to cross this a low level API and provide something high, higher level and the higher level should be Scala API. We should, uh, we should encapsulate this low level API to nice domain specific language, which we called Shalala, according to some restaurant in Mountain View, which sells uh, soup. <laughs> so, <laughs> It's favorite restaurant there, so it was nice, nice idea how to how to call the language. So in fact, Shalala is Scala DSL or internal DSL based on Scala language, which uh, make abstraction over our low-level computation API. And the goal of this API is just to make writing. Map reduce or computation tasks easier and also manipulate with data in easy way. But still we want to stay in JVM. We don't, we don't want to publish the operation via, via REST API because we have already have this API. We would like to stay in JVM and make the best of JVM. And then there is also a nice you know, integration of REPL into our H2O, which, you, uh, which provides a way how to play with this Shalala. So what are the basic concepts of this Shalala DSL? We play with tabular, tabular data, with frames. And if you are familiar with R, you can uh, you perhaps know that frame is abstraction of data, which uh, which uh, consists of uh, vectors or columns. Each column has a name and uh, data type and uh, obtain the data. So we uh, took the same approach, how to represent data in Shalala. And, and uh, uh, we call that distributed frame and in fact, the data in the frame are distributed across your cloud. I will speak about that later, or, and perhaps Cliff will cl clarify this in his technical talk. Then, this is uh, this uh, frame, distributed frame, is the first class entity which we need to operate over. And then we need to provide expressions how to operate with the, uh, with the frames, how to access the columns, how to access the data how to make the basic operation over data, and how to make uh, operation with the frames. And also, the language should provide easy access to our low-level API. So if there is some functionality which you cannot solve with Shalala, you can still switch to low-level H2 API and just uh, implement your functionality via Java API. So for frame operations, I will just summarize several of, several of them and then show uh, more of them du uh, during the demo. But uh, they are divided into uh, obvious steps. You need to load data, parse data, then you need to select uh, columns or manipulate with the columns. Then you need to store data into our internal store 
H2 is using internally uh, DKV store, which is distributed over the cloud. So uh, DSL also provides the functions, how to access this DKV store. And so there are simple operations. And in this case, we are uh, motivated by R, because a lot of data scientists knows R, and they can develop simple, or simple, <laughs> they can develop uh, not only simple analysis in R, so we would like to uh, provide the similar commands in our uh, Scala DSL, that if data analysts come, look at the program in Shalala, it can read the program and decide what is the program, uh, what the program is doing. And then we have, of course, some distributed uh, operation. So we provide uh, currently just three of them. You can still switch to our low-level API, but currently we provide a map just for mapping uh, one given operation, given user method over the, uh, over the data, filtering, and collecting. And you can see that the API is still a little bit ugly. I will speak about that later, that there are some limitations which we need still cross. But we are still working on that. So how it, uh, how it is implemented internally? It's small magic. More about the magic. Uh, will be in the uh, in the uh, talk of Cliff, but I will just clarify what the Scala DSL is doing. In fact, the basic thing is that in H2 we are using our own class loader, which is responsible for a lot of things, for optimization data structures or generation parts of data structure which we pass around the cloud and uh, for some uh, typing things. So we need to preserve the semantics of class order in cooperation with Scala. So it's one, one thing. Then we need to translate the Scala, Scala uh, code or uh, the DSL code, which user types, we need to translate to our internal Java API. So this is uh, quite easy task, but still we need to live in the world of H2, which say there are some limitations regarding what you can pass around the cloud and what you can do. But still it's, it can be done quite easily. And also in our low level Java API, we really focus on preserving primitive types and computation with primitive types everywhere just to avoid unboxing, boxing. So all the translation from Scala part to uh, Java, Java part has to, has to uh, preserve all primitive types. So one example how a filter operation is implemented. I will go to the slide. And filter operation takes, uh, in fact, functor which is mapped over all the values in the frame. It's one kind. It's one kind of the filter operation which we provide. And you can see it's a little bit ugly. Normally, you would expect here uh, some kind of closure, but currently we uh, have to be nice. Uh, to our class order, so currently this closure is encapsulated in our uh, data structure, and the code is translated to low-level uh, H2 API. I wrote this example in Scala just to see uh, what is uh, what we are doing internally, but the same version is you can find in Java code. So in fact, we are. We have MapReduce ta task, which runs around the cloud, look at the data, and run given operation. The MapReduce task, as you know, 
it's map reduce task, so it has two operation map reduce. We uh, we are taking uh, classical uh, map reduce approach, so mapping over the values. The values is a chunk, and chunk in fact is part of data which is distributed over the cloud, and it contains the rows from the data set. And on the data, you can over this data you can do a lot of operations. And then, for example, here there, there is no reduce stage because you don't need to reduce data. It just needs to compute something. In this case, we are filtering uh, the values. So we are just appending to a new vector the values which satisfies the pre uh, predicate. And then there is some technical magic that you have to uh, preserve uh, the naming of the vectors in the resulting frame, the types, the domains of the vectors, and so on. More about that, I think, will be in the talk of the of Cliff. And I think it's time for demo. So I will try just <coughs> this. So what I did, I launched one instance of H2 uh, H2, so I launched a virtual machine with oh, some flags, and by default, H2 expose uh, REST API, and we have uh, some web UI to access the web API. So I will go to the browser and show you that I'm not lying, that there is something running. And it's one one way how to access H2. And I can look to the store, which is what is inside, and there is nothing. Nothing is running. And I can look to the cloud status. So I have, I ra I'm running the cloud of only one machine here on this machine. So I will go back to the console. And I will try to parse some data. Some data. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so I uh, I par a simple data set, which is one of the favorite data set. Uh, design for prediction, and uh, in fact, the data set contains eight columns, and 406 rows. And you can, just to believe that I load something, I will go to uh, web UI and show you that there is something, some data loaded. <coughs> and it contains eight columns and a lot of rows. So now I can start to play with data. So I can look at the first column. So it contains the name of the data. Uh, of the of the car. In fact, the data set contains uh, different types of cars with their properties, like uh, year or of creation, weight, uh, power, number of cylinders, economy, and so on. So I will try just show you several operations over the data set. I can look, for example, of number of cylinders, or I prefer I prepare several examples here. I can make look at the last column, which is a year. You can see that the year is just a small number, <coughs> and I would like to uh, would like to transform this column to a new column, which will contain the full year dated from uh, year zero. So I make transformation and uh, 
in REPL, we are just showing uh, 10 lines of the data set, but just show you more lines. We can look at all the lines of the vector which we created. There is an uh, important point that at this, at this uh, stage, we are not creating any frames. So if we are go, if we go back to the inspect or store view, you will still see that there is only one frame, one data frame, which was created. And I also can s access this view from the console. So I can look at the number of the keys. So there is only one key which is representing one data frame which I loaded. But I can also look at our internal data structure. So access our, our internal Java API. So I will say, show me all the keys which are created in DKV store. So you can see that there are a lot of technical or internal keys, which are in fact representing the parts of the data which are normally distributed. Now they are just stored in one JVM and also the parts of data which uh, represent uh, the vector which I created in REPL. I can also make a Boolean vector from filtering all the cars or uh, accessing one vector and making a Boolean vector saying this car has more than four cylinders or less. And internally, it's in fact simple map operation taking initial frame and saying, accessing the second column and asking the second column if it contains more than four cylinders or not. And the result is a new vector containing <coughs> containing, uh, containing uh, the Boolean values. And I can, in fact, compare both columns, uh, both created vectors, and just uh, make uh, just look at the difference between the vectors, and you can see that I'm not lying that both vectors are the same. And in fact, internally, uh, the operation of Boolean predicate is implemented in the simple map call. And the same for also for filtering. So if I would like to filter all the cars, I can use the same, the same call, just using the filter operation. And the filter, filter operation will go through whole data set and look at each row and apply the predicate at each row and decide this row should be included in the resulting data set or not. So if I compute number of row of this filter operation, uh, okay, it's variable F6. So you can see that there is 195 cars which, has, which have more than four cylinders. So this is uh, one way how to manipulate with data. But we, H2 also provides different kind of analysis. I am personally involved on uh, DRF, which is distributed random forest implementation, operation algorithm, which, uh, which we provide. So I will try to run that, run that over the car data and make a prediction about the number of uh, cylinders. So I will create some 
small data structure. So I will, in, uh, I will create a new frame, which is called source, which will contain uh, only selected columns. So I will skip the first column with the name, because it has no predictive power. And I will skip uh, the column uh, with cylinders, because this is my response, which I will be predicting later. And then I will include all the columns. So I created a new frame. In fact, I can save this frame to DKV if I want. So let's call the frame source.hex. This hex means that it's our internal data format. And by this call, I just save the created frame to DKV. So let's look here. And you can see, OK, there is some source.hex frame, which contains only selected uh, columns and all the rows. Then I will take the second column with the cylinders. And create a DRF model based on this data set. By this call, I'm saying take the source, build a random forest model over the source, and the response column, which is, pre uh, which is uh, an objective of the prediction, uh, is the second parameter of the call. And the last parameter is the number of, uh, number of uh, trees which will, which will be generated in the resulting random forest. Uh, I switch on uh, the logging, so you will see that it's something, the engine is doing something. So I will launch it. And you can see there are several, several log mes messages saying, OK, I'm, we are starting DRF computation with these parameters. And then we are building a uh, collection of decision trees and computing the, some errors over the tree and some properties. And the result of this call is DRF model. And it contains all the data which you need to store for this kind of models. I was doing regression, so I can take the model and ask the model what he thinks about the given data. And I will be lying a little bit here because I will use the same data as I was using for training. So it will give it, or the model should give good, really good prediction. So I will launch a scoring part of the model and I will, I will use the source data for the scoring. And there is one point which I have to stress that the source, it does not contain the response column. So really model has to take, has to look at the, at the uh, data, and ask all the trees what uh, the trees thinks about, about the data. And in this case, I am accessing our Java API. So the model is uh, the object published by H2O, and the score method it's not it's not a wrapper from Scala, but it's really a Java method taking uh, taking. Uh, a frame as a parameter. So I generated a prediction. I was, and the result of prediction is the frame. But here I leaked the internal frame. So I will I will create this distributed frame. 
and you can see the result of the prediction. So we say uh, the model thinks about the first row of the data. So let's look at the first row of the data. The model thinks that AM is some car with name AMC Ambassador has eight columns. And in fact, it has eight columns. So I would like to see uh, what is the general error for this prediction. So I will compute uh, the squared error for each row. So <coughs> I will just take one vector containing the response and the predicted vector. I forget this. Response. So I compute for each row, I compute it uh, in fact, square error. And now I'm interested in the sum of all these square errors. So I will launch map reduce operation over whole data and compute the sum of that. For this, I have simple operation prepared here. And what I'm doing, I'm collecting uh, data over the cloud. In this case, I'm collecting single double. And single double is computed for each row in the, in the, uh, in the given data set, in the given frame. And it should produce the sum of all, all, the, all, the, uh, all the rows. You can see here that I'm using reduce operation, which in fact I can avoid in the future just by using nice types, which will implement the plus operation by default. So that was a demo of the DSL. And if I go back to the view, web view, you can look that there is some entity which is called DRF underscore and big string. And this is not a frame. This is not a vector. This is a model which we generated by calling DRF API. And in fact, the, here is a simple view of the model which contains all the information. And also, we can access the code of the model. So we can look, in fact, at generated code of the model, which can be used later for some prediction. So I will go back to the presentation and just, just tell you something, tell you something more about future plans. In fact, the goal is to uh, have the API, which is similar to Scalding API, but we, we are still battling with some limitation introduced by H2O. As I mentioned, this class loader and generator, generating of bytecode. And we would like to support more uh, distributed operations, more high level distributed operation. You can still go to our low level API. And general idea is to introduce algebraic operation as, was, as they are introduced uh, in algeb algebra. So if you are interested in participation, you can simply git clone our repository because it's open source. You can switch to the H2 Scala branch and just play with that or really simply, simply contribute. Or there is also a release, which is a small link at the bottom of the, of the, of the uh, slide, which you can download and just try H2 Scala repel and try, try to play with that. So that's uh, all from me. And Cliff is waiting for his talk. So thank you.
It's getting late, so I will go quick and then we'll go time for Q&A. Um, and so I will skip through a bunch of stuff that's sort of boilerplate here. Um, I hope it's not auto forwarding. Okay, yes, it's auto forwarding. Okay, so I don't know what you did. Let's back up a little bit here. Okay, so this is sort of obvious. Um, we're open source. You can find us on the Git. There's a Git, uh, the GitHub, and also um, xeroxdata.com right on the front of our webpage. And you already know we're a platform for doing math. Um, so let's just roll along. So I'm gonna dive into some details on the insides of the Java implementation. And the reason for diving down there is to show you why we're getting speed. So when I say speed, I, I mean that most of our math operations are completely memory bandwidth bound um, on the data, which means it's, it's milliseconds per gigabyte. As you do more math per row, that number of that balance might change. You might be doing more FP versus memory. But typically, we're like really, really fast. So when other people say, yeah, we do big data and really fast, we're usually 10x, 100x. I mean, we're, we're fast. So the basic notion that uh, Mikhail is showing you was that we have a notion of a, a vector. It's, like a, it's an array, um, but it's a big array. And it could be much, much bigger than a Java int. That's why the length is listed as a long. And it supports fast random access from any node to any piece of data, but we're geared to running to um, linear access pass over the entire data. That's where you're gonna get your, your most speed out. So a taxonomy, there is a big vector. It could be a very large vector. Conceptually, it's a Java primitive or double, but actually it's compressed internally. The compression schemes are quite aggressive, and I'll talk about that in a minute because that's part of our speed. Um, and so we're often seeing two to four X better than gzip on disk. So better than gzip on disk in memory while getting speed out of it. The vector is distributed across a cluster and it's kept in the Java heap, not off heap. And that gets us really fast access to it from Java, which makes for very convenient programming. Um, but it means you have to watch out for GC and we've done that. We've taken our care that we can uh, spill the disk as needed. Um, and because we keep the data in very large arrays of primitives, typical GC costs are very modest. For a 32 gig heap, um, a full GC cycle is usually under a second, and they come around from time to time, but under a second, I don't care. Um, whereas new gen collections are in they're, they're blazingly fast. Uh, a 200 gig heap will have full GCs on that over a couple seconds. Within the, the same heap, we'll have a collection of vectors, um, what was uh, typically called a, a frame. And the key notion here is that we are aligning the rows within the JVM across this way, so that if you're talking about all the elements of that car data set, what year, how many cylinders that car have, what's its weight and displacement, all that data is local on one JVM and you can do some math on it at you know, memory bandwidth speed. So that, yeah, so it's a frame. And, and essentially you can think of this as this a tabular data or it's a, a struct of arrays instead of an array of structs. That's the conceptual view of it. Within that big old pile of data, we're breaking up the vectors into chunks, where a chunk is a thousand to a million elements, depending. It's stored compressed, and the compression strategy is sort of key to speed in a lot of ways. Um, basically, more compression is good because we get more data per cache miss, and it, it's how long it takes to drag the data in from memory that sort of matters on things. They're all aligned going across, as I mentioned before, and so you can essentially think you're looking at a struct that you can read and write and toy with directly like it's a struct in Java. You can write to it as well as read from it. And we'll follow the Java memory model rules down the line all the way. Um, that chunk is also the unit of uh, execution. So one CPU will grab a chunk of rows and do whatever math you're asking for all across all those rows all in one set. And that means that it's also single threaded on those rows. And so there's no synchronization games being played in the code that you're looking at. It, you're guaranteed single threaded access to the rows that you're you know, handed to. That granularity is big enough to cover all our control overheads, all the management costs of launching a thread to deal with a pile of data, and small enough to get good fine grained data parallelism out of it. Um, because that one, one CPU does that chunk, all the other CPUs will be grabbing their own independent chunks and will typically light up all the cores across all the machines in the cluster and it'll do the math in one big pass of the data and be done. 
um, the, within this kind of taxonomy, um, HSO is handling all the communications and data management. It's handling all the communication between the nodes. As you do uh, reduces, you have to roll things up across the cluster and so on. Within a single node, we're using Dougley's fork join to do the chunk by chunk execution where you're typically expecting a few thousands of chunks, uh, more or less, depending on this volume of the data. Uh, and that's going to be round robin, however fork join does it across however many, you know, 4, 8, 16 CPUs you have. We typically see we get really good behavior out of fork join, except for the cases I'll talk in a minute. So there's a taxonomy, um, there's a frame, it's a 2D table where the cross is columns, typically hundreds, can be thousands, can be hundreds of thousands, but the rows will run on to the millions and billions. So however much fits in all the RAM in your cluster. Within that collection, a column, we call a VEC internally, it's a column of data, it's a big array. That's broken up to chunks, 1,000 to a million at a pop. A chunk is a collection of elements. Elements conceptually a Java double. How it's actually stored in memory varies according to the compression strategy of the moment. Um, but you can ask for it back as a double value or as an int. Uh, and we also support like the notion of missing elements is really crucial for a lot of the data science stuff. So that said, the, the platform as a whole can be considered a couple different layers. Um, there's this layer where they use the REST and JSON that Mikhail talked about earlier. Um, that's the layer where you treat the box as a big box for doing the cluster, as a big box for doing math. Load this data, run a logistic regression, run a random forest, get some results, cycle back around. Add columns, drop columns, manufacture features, run another model, score it, go again. Um, you might be driving that from the internal H2O console, you could be driving it from Scala, but you might be driving it from R or Python or Mathematica or whatever. Um, here I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit more on the innards of the system, the data parallel coding layer. And this would be for people who are implementing stuff at the Java level. And so Mikhail's doing Scala to Java, and we have other engineers doing R to Java, and I'm implementing, well, other people are implementing new math algorithms. So whether it's k-means or uh, you know, gradient boosting or whatever, that's the layer that you would talk to the system at. And then there's more complicated stuff you can do if you want to get sort of heads down in the system. So I'm going to give one or two examples of the Java, but this is a Scala group, so I'm going to leave it at that. And then I'm going to go dive into uh, some of the guts of the system and, and why things go fast, and then I'll stop, and this will be like a whirlwind tour of things really quick because it's getting late and we'll just take a Q&A after that. So here's, a, here's sort of the simplest map reduce task that does something interesting. And this is an example from linear regression, and I'm just trying to accumulate the sums of squares of a particular vector. And so I'm going to make a map reduce task, it has a map and a reduce. Map is a function which takes uh, a thing of type A and produces a thing of type B. In this case, type A is a double. Type B is also a double, but it doesn't have to be, and the next slide will change it up a little bit. And reduce takes two things of type B and makes one thing out of it, and that's, uh, it, collapses, it reduces your data, right? So this is a, a piece of code that will run at the memory bandwidth speeds across the cluster in like five, six lines and compute sums of squares across the cluster, you know, sort of just like that. Uh, I can have a more complicated example. In particular, I can have state. Um, here I've got my type A is a pair of doubles, and my type B is uh, this Java object called an LRPass1, which has three internal fields. And the map call is go do something with all the fields. Let's go scribble on them. And the reduce is take of this and of that, so that this is implicit, and that that's the other side of it, and it will do the reduction. And that will run across your cluster, doing all the right things. So within a node, the reduction is obviously doing two Java objects and squishing them together. But across the cluster, one of the Java objects got serialized and shipped over the wire, and then uh, they got reduced on the other side. Um, I'll touch this a little bit, and then we'll move on. Um, for efficiency, we do a lot of, uh, we do batching. So a whole chunk is passed into a map call at once. And we typically write at this layer, but you can write this one line and it'll work. But at this layer, you can see that there's a loop over a chunk, which is a thousand to a million elements. And the, the dot app calls here are doing the decompression strategy, which might vary from chunk to chunk to chunk to chunk, right? But this is typically a few clock cycles to decompress and pull data out. Then you do your math and you go on. The rest of the code was the same as the last slide. So that's sort of it for the whirlwind Java side of things, and now I'm just going to dive into some 
technical concerns. So these are all slides I wrote in the last half an hour, so pardon me if they're a little brief or a little raw. Um, so, so we're concerned with big, and whenever we're concerned with big, you're concerned with speed. Um, because typically the problem is big got slow. So how fast is fast? Typically we have to see all the data and it's big. And we also typically have you know, less math than the memory bandwidth it takes to drag the data in. So if you're doing a logistic regression, you're doing what's called a gram matrix, it's a bunch of floating point ops for every row that comes in. If you don't have very many columns, it's not that many floating point ops, and the cache miss time from x86 to memory, it far exceeds the cost of doing a few floating point ops. So you can decompress in the shadow of the memory bandwidth, right? And more decompression is better, or more compression is better, because that means you've got more data in one cache miss. So currently we have about 15 different compression schemes, and we can drop another one in in half a day or so. Um, and they vary all over the map. They're obvious ones, or just take the data without compression, but then you might do a bias and a scale off of a thing, or you might say, it's, oh, it's Boolean only, so it's a bit set, or it's very sparse data, so there's a run length encoding going on. There's a bunch of different compression strategies. And uh, the, the, they're picked per chunk. We inspect all the data at the time we load it and decide on the best compression strategy for this few thousand rows, and we keep varying them as we go. The only thing that's key there is all the decompression schemes take a couple of clock cycles to go <coughs> decompress the data and then you can go do lots of time to do your math on it after that. Um, serialization. So serialization is this funny thing. You might think with big data that serialization is a key issue when you're dealing with a cluster, and it is, but for not for the obvious reason. You can't send the big data across the cluster or you're just gonna drown an individual node in the data. The assumption, the guiding assumption you have to start out with is there's just more data that's gonna fit on your one machine. So you just can't ask for it all in one machine, and you don't want to pass it through the one machine either. You want to keep it in memory. So you're not passing around the big data, but you are passing around tons and tons of small data, things that are plain old Java objects that are part of doing your math. They're accumulating histograms and sums and variances. They're building a gram matrix, or they're building uh, you know, partial dependency graphs, or whatever they're building. They're doing something with the math, and that's getting passed around the cluster. So we have to have a fast way to send POJOs around the cluster. Since we already had a bytecode weaver in place for a variety of reasons, we went ahead and threw in serialization in the bytecode weaver. And it does sort of the fastest possible thing you can imagine. It writes the fields via unsafe directly into direct byte buffers. Um, there's one two byte token at the start of any send of a nested Java object that defines the entire layout of the whole thing. And after that, it's just the data. And then we compress that as well because typically we have more CPU than network bandwidth. And so it's faster to compress and send a compression than it is to send the raw data. The, the direct byte buffer access is all just uh, loads and stores and nothing else. There's no smarts in there at all. It's literally take this field and lift and store it um, with compression as you went. We are right into streaming asynchronous NIO buffers. There's multiple shared TCP channels, uh, full app level recovery and retry. You can pull a cable on a cluster and add it back, back in five minutes later and things will just recover. Um, we do make a decision to send small stuff via UDP and big stuff via TCP, and that's because there's a lot of small stuff, and UDP is usually very, very reliable, and it's much faster than TCP in that zone. And it turns out that TCP, while well, everyone knows UDP is unreliable, that's what the U is, so we have to have a reliability layer for that, it turns out TCP is unreliable as well. And in a couple minutes uh, in my labs or EC2 or wherever, I can cause TCP to fail. And when I say fail, I mean silently the sender will open a socket, write some data, and close the socket, and the receiver will get no data, and no arrows will be thrown on either side. The data will just go into the bit bucket and be gone. So you think of TCP as a reliable communication channel. And in fact, it is not. And that only happens under heavy, heavy load, but I can drive that system to the maximum possible load you can get. And under that kind of scenarios, TCP channels drop silently. So I have a reliability layer built in for UDP and for TCP, it's the same layer. Um, a little bit more on MapReduce. Uh, a map call is made once per chunk. Um, typically, they have a couple thousand per node. You know, more or less the amount of data you've loaded, but if you've piled on a lot of data, you'll have thousands, uh, maybe millions, and not millions unless you get really big boxes. Um, and we're using fork join for the fine-grained parallelism. Um, more on that in a minute as well. 
the reduction is a little different than the usual Hadoop reduction people think about. Instead of us running all our maps at, up front and saving the data to disk, and then the shuffle and pull it all back and do the reductions, we don't ever go to disk, so we reduce early and we reduce often. Every pair of maps, when they're done, immediately a reduction happens. And if another pair of maps are run and they reduce, when those two reduces are done, they reduce again immediately. So the reductions happen sort of incrementally uh, on the fly as the data is, as the math is worked. So you always keep the data size of your final result crunched down to the smallest you can fit in memory, uh, you know, subject to the constraints of running as much in parallel as you can. Once you're done doing all the uh, reductions on a node, it'll go, of course, over the wire and you get a log tree roll up. Uh, people know what a log tree roll up is? Every pair of nodes in the cluster uh, consider themselves buddies, and, and one of them is the parent of a tree, and the two tree parents are our buddies and go up again, you get another layer. Standard binary tree thing. So that the time it takes to do a fast math pass will be a, a log tree walk across the cluster, then everyone does their math, and a log tree walk back over, and you'll be network latency bound. Sort of the limiting, and that's one of the reasons I went to UDP packets for small data, if you're doing a small roll-up, a small result, like you're computing the averages and standard deviations or linear regression kind of thing, you're gonna have a small result. It's all gonna run in UDP packets, and that is your memory, that is your latency on getting that job done. Fork joint experience. Um, I had some, some hard thoughts on this one. Uh, this is kind of fun stuff. Fork join sort of a new framework in Java 8, um, but it's been around for a long time. And Doug Lee's been working on it for a long time, and I have a lot of respect for Doug, and he's done some really great stuff. And I think fork join really is good, but it has some interesting gotchas to it. Um, the good stuff first, so there's a learning curve, and once you're over it, it's actually easy enough to write and use. We use it all the time. There must be hundreds, maybe a thousand or more uses of fork join scattered throughout the code. Um, so it's full featured, it's flexible. It keeps you know, all the CPUs busy. I can have huge piles of tiny, tiny jobs running around or handfuls of big jobs. It all seems to work really well. So in that sense, fork join's good. Some hard experience comes out of that. Um, blocking threads while you're running on fork join is hard on it because he has to realize a thread has been stolen for blocking, usually in an I.O. call, and start another thread. And so sometimes you get thread starvation issues. And working around that somewhat painful, the recommended thing is to rewrite your code in a style uh, that uses what's called counted completers. And now you're doing continuation passing styles. How many people here know what continuation passing style is? Uh, oh, pretty good. OK, so third half. Um, basically, I'm writing continuation passing style in Java if I don't want to have thread blocking issues. And that's kind of painful to do. Hmm. Um, you'll find that buried throughout the code that happens in various key algorithms because it was just too hard to get it right and too painful to leave it sitting the way it is. Um, there's no priority queues. There's this one big fat happy queue in fork join. But you have to have thread priorities for a variety of reasons. In particular, if you've got a web server and the web pages don't have any priority, they can't service a page. You can't even get a status update, a, you know, a polling bar moving across your browser because you, all CPUs are swamped doing work. The web server can't get a, you know, Kind of clock in edgewise, right? So we built priority queues into the system, um, built over the fork join layer, and that's also crucial in making the key value store go fast. Um, kind of buried under the hood, I think, I think uh, uh, Mikhail mentioned it, we have a key value store. Uh, I'll claim it's one of the fastest ones on the planet. I'd love to go measure that, but a, a cache hitting put or cache hitting get or 150 nanos, basically a hash table lookup, but a cache miss is uh, going over the wire and back. And to keep that from causing a circular chain of cache missing, asking for somebody else to do something around the cluster, there's priority queues built into the system for the key value store. In exchange for that, the KB store, even when you cache miss, is uh, nothing more than the direct NIO UDP socket back and forth round trip to kind of get stuff done. Um, a few of the things I think, uh, you gotta pay attention to, by default in fork join, exceptions are silently dropped. The thread that takes an exception doing a piece of your work just like goes back to the idle queue and like waits for the next job to show up. And that usual symptom of that is he doesn't complete his job because he threw an exception. He doesn't tell anyone he didn't complete it because he just silently dropped it. And, and in the end, what happens is that all your threads suddenly go idle 
and the job's not done. And we're all waiting for some last guy to complete something, but he's never going to. It, it went away. So you, it's just a maintenance disaster. You just have to catch and track and log all exceptions. And, and so that when the thing hangs, you can go back and look and see, well, who threw an exception? So we went a step further after that and said, OK, we're going to take all the log exceptions and pass them around the cluster and roll them back up. So they get rethrown at the call site of the original MapReduce task. So somebody says, new MapReduce task dot do all of a vector and big math, whatever, fine. That'll throw an exception at you. That'll come back and say, hey, node, yada, yada, yada over there through this exception. And here's his stack trace. And it's, it's just like a huge help in debugging things. Um, Try completes one of the key things to count right. It's part of the learning curve. Once you figure out how it works, it's not so bad. Um, but in the beginning, you'll blow the counts on try completes. Too many or too few. And jobs will complete out of order early or late or not at all, so on and so forth. Um, early on when using fork join, we did a lot of fork bombings of ourselves, including the point where the CPU, the, the box was unusable. We had to reboot it. Um, so you just have to watch that, cap all your thread pulls. Uh, and maybe throw warnings out saying, hey, hey, somehow I'm asking to launch the thousandth thread. Is this a good idea, right? And when you cap thread pulls, you then can get into uh, deadlock issues because all threads are actually blocked waiting for some other event, which is on another node whose all threads are blocked waiting event happening on your node. And so in that situation, uh, you either have to have priority queues, which fixes some of them, or go to the CPS style to fix it again. So anyhow, despite all that, I would use fork join again. Um, it, it, when it works, it works really, really well. And they're just these edge cases you gotta know about to figure out how to, to work around it. Okay, and that's actually the end of my quick pass through things. I have some more Java examples, which I can step through, and I have some summary slides. So let's summaries real quick, and then we'll go Q&A, and I'll pull up other slides if people want them. Um, you know, the real summary here is that most simple Java just works in those MapReduce calls. It, it runs at memory bandwidth speeds. Um, parallel distributed reads and writes and pins all just go. You can do conflicting writes, um, and we'll follow the Java memory model, which is pretty loosey-goosey. Uh, so you might not get what you want, but it will be, you know, honestly, the JMM. Um, and we're writing big data analytics, state-of-the-art algorithms, uh, running distributed. And, and this slide's now old. I'd say that we're solidly, solidly working at 200 gig data sets. And we have definitely tested uh, terabyte size data sets before. So, you know, it's, it's the big data. And we're doing big math on the big data at fast speeds. And that's it. All right.